good afternoon uh, everyone today we are uh, going to complete uh, part 5 of complete denture uh, so today we'll be discussing about occlusion uh, in complete denture in detail and we'll also be tackling some uh, revision mcq so that we don't forget our concepts which we have previously studied uh, yeah so let's get started so uh, occlusion can be defined as the static relationship between the incising or masticating surfaces of the maxillary or mandibular teeth or tooth analogs. Uh, to be noted that occlusion is a static relationship, okay? It is a static relationship and not a dynamic, okay? It is a static relationship. Now, uh, a few differences between uh, the natural and artificial dentition. Let's go through point by point. Uh, natural teeth function independently because definitely we know we have the enamel dentine, the pulp, the periodontal ligament. It's one unit. Each tooth is a separate unit. Okay, So they function independently, each tooth. But what happens in our complete denture or artificial teeth? It functions as a group, meaning the whole set of teeth, the 28 teeth which are going to give in one arch in, in both the arches are going to uh, function as a unit. The whole denture base is uniting all the teeth together so it is one unit okay one unit for the upper one unit for the lower proprioceptive impulses avoid occlusal prematurities prematurities in natural dentition so proprioceptive impulses uh, what they mean to say is the periodontal ligament around our natural tooth has proprioception the property of proprioception so this impulses they avoid the occlusal prematurities okay if there is any occlusal prematurities in natural dentition automatically the teeth will uh, recognize this prematurity and go into a more comfortable position so that no uh, destruction of the rest of the tissues occur now what happens in artificial dentition it is supported by a common denture base on which all the teeth are arranged right so the common denture base doesn't have any proprioception it is a non-living thing definitely right so the base it rests on mucosa and therefore it cannot uh, distinguish between these proprioceptive impulses and therefore it cannot avoid occlusal prematurities okay the next point is malocclusion can be non-problematic for years in natural dentition meaning it will not affect your muscles or your residual uh, ridges or anything if there is a malocclusion in natural dentition because our teeth are made like that to withstand these kind of variations but in artificial dentition malocclusion can cause immediate problems and they will cause uh, instability of the denture or uh, discomfort to the patient basically okay then non-vertical forces are well tolerated non-vertical forces are damaging definitely if there are any lateral forces which are falling on the denture it is going to tilt move there are going to be teetering of the denture base and therefore it will cause instability consequently it's going to cause dis discomfort to the patient okay this point is very important bilateral balance is rarely found and is not necessary in natural dentition bilateral balance is not found in natural dentition but bilateral balance is mandatory in producing stability in artificial dentition that that is in complete denture we have to aim to get bilateral balanced occlusion why what everything we will be seeing in the next slides okay the next point the second molar favors mastication owing to the leverage and power so in your natural dentition in the second molar region majority of the mastication takes place but in artificial dentition, if we put the pressure on the second molar, there will be a tilt in the denture basis. Now, in the natural dentition, incising does not affect posterior teeth. But in artificial dentition, incising can cause tipping of the denture or from the posterior region. And the last point is due to the proprioception mechanism, a person can avoid premature contacts and interferences in natural dentition but the same uh, the same thing as i told you before because there is proprioception of the periodontal ligament we know even if we 
uh, bite uh, on a stone or or anything very hard immediately you will get to know that there is something wrong okay but in your artificial dentition or your complete denture the patient will not get to know if you are biting anything uh, which is not supposed to be bitten basically because that proprioception is not there in your dentures okay so any premature contacts or any cuspal interferences will dislodge the denture that is it's going to cause denture instability okay so these are were a few points which are summarized and this is a difference between your natural and artificial dentition next coming to the type of occlusion in complete denture we will be going to each one now uh, the different types are first is your balanced occlusion then is monoplane occlusion and then is lingualized occlusion moving on to balanced occlusion now the definition of balanced occlusion is that it is the simultaneous contacting of the maxillary and the mandibular teeth on the right and the left side in the anterior and posterior occlusal areas in centric and eccentric position develop to lessen or limit the tipping or rotating of the denture base in relation to the supporting structures now basically uh, it's a very uh, long and maybe complicated definition maybe all will feel but to just make it simple and to summarize what they are trying to say in this and which is very important to understand before we go into into the details of balanced occlusion is that what they are trying to say is whenever the movement occurs you can see in these pictures whenever you're moving your dentures to the right or the left or the front when you're doing protrusion retrusion any any movements basically any uh, lateral movements or in centric or eccentric on the right and the left side any time there should be contacts basically the upper and lower denture have to contact whenever the denture is moving to the left or to the right or even in protrusive there has to be occlusal contacts on either side on the working side on the right and the left all the side so basically why they want contact on all the side that is right and left anterior and posterior is because they want to stabilize the denture okay if there is contact only on one side you can imagine there will be a gap here and therefore it will tilt the denture so basically they are trying to say there is a simultaneous contact of the maxillary and mandibular teeth on all right and left posterior anterior centric and eccentric position this is basically done to limit the instability of the denture to make it more stable basically now balanced articulation that was the definition of balanced occlusion now balanced articulation is the static and dynamic bilateral simultaneous contact relationship between the occlusal surfaces of the opposing jaws during function okay basically this is static and dynamic occlusion is just the static uh, position this is static and dynamic okay that that's why it's called articulation now uh, i had explained to you in the last class about uh, when i was explaining to you about mandibular movements i had uh, briefly described what do you call the working side what is called the non working side uh, i had put up a diagram and if you all remember um the working side is the side on which your mandible moves like suppose i'm moving my mandible to the right hand side the right hand side will be your working and the left hand side will be your non working or balancing side okay so let's come uh, let's brush up a little with that the working side it is the side on which the chewing is being done at the movement it is the side to which the mandible has moved as i said if it is moving to the right hand side right side will be the working side and the non working or the balancing side it is the opposite side to the working side it is the side on which although there is a greater separation of teeth there is at least one point of contact between the upper and lower it is also the side on which the greater condylar movement has occurred okay we will see it in this uh, uh, diagram now in this diagram the mandible is moving towards your right hand side okay it's moving towards your right hand side so right hand side is your working side and the left side will be your balancing side last class i had explained to you all that on the working side the condyle only rotates and it only moves laterally and it rotates but in your non working side or your balancing side it bodily moves outside the uh, glenoid fossa and there is a translatory movement across an arc of a motion which is called the non working side or the orbiting condyle if you all remember last time i had explained 
So the same concept is applied here. So basically, when the mandible is moving on the right hand side, the right is the working and the left is the balancing side. Okay, we need to know this before getting into the details of balanced occlusion. So now why balanced occlusion? Why can't we give any normal occlusion what we have had in our maybe natural dentition? Why do we have to balance this? Why do we have to do so much of trouble to get all the teeth to contact in all the different movements? Okay, that is to improve stability. Okay. Now, after stability is improved, now if your denture bases are not moving and they're stable on your uh, ridges or your tissues, what will happen? There will be less residual ridge resorption and therefore there will be preservation of ridges, right? So improved stability leads to your preservation of ridges, okay? So that is the second point why we require balanced occlusion. And the third is that since it's going to be a smooth gliding motion on either side, left, right, lateral movements, protrusive, there will be no interferences and there will be no, uh, basically the denture will not hit each other and there will be more stability, there will be more retention because of the less interferences, okay? So these are the three main advantages why we require balanced, bilateral balanced occlusion in complete denture. That is improved stability, preservation of ridges and no interferences. Now the possible disadvantages what can be associated with bilateral balanced occlusion is that it may tend to encourage lateral and protrusive grinding. Then now since you have given a smooth gliding motion in all the movements, the patient may tend to have a lateral or protrusive grinding because it is smooth. They are not getting any interference. So they might tend to bite in, lat in your uh, excursive phase or maybe uh, may lead to a little bit of bruxism or they say lateral movements, you know. So although this habit may be confined to those people who are subjected to irre irrelevant muscle activity. Point number two, it is difficult to achieve it in mouths where there is an increased in vertical incisal overlap. And point number three, a semi-adjustable or a fully adjustable articulator is required. You cannot give bilateral balanced occlusion without a semi-adjustable or fully adjustable, okay? You cannot use your hinge articulator or your mean value articulator, no. It's a total no-no. You cannot use these two. You have to use a semi-adjustable. Now coming to Hanau squint. Now basically, uh, Rudolf H. Hanau, uh, he was an engineer, okay? Uh, he gave nine points which would help in balanced occlusion or which are to be considered to provide bi bilateral balanced occlusion for our complete dentures, but then they condensed it and they made it into five main points that is called as the Hanau squint. So the five main points which you have to remember it are the condylar guidance, the incisal guidance, the relative cusp height, compensative curves, and the plane of orientation of the occlusal plane, basically the occlusal plane. These five points are the uh, five factors that dictate balanced occlusion, okay? This slide shows that, that the factors influencing balanced occlusion are these main five factors. That is the condylar guidance, incisal guidance, the plane of occlusion, the cuspal angulation, and the compensative curves. So basically, it's getting balanced occlusion in a complete denture is a play within these five factors. You have to increase, decrease to get that stable balanced occlusion. So these are the five factors which you're going to play with to give your balanced occlusion in complete denture. Now, Thielman gave a very uh, easy formula by which you can understand balanced occlusion very easily. If you remember this formula, it is a basic thing to remember balanced occlusion, okay? So let's go through the formula. C is your balanced occlusion. So balanced occlusion is equal to condylar guidance into incisal guidance divided by occlusal plane into cuspal inclination into compensating curve. Now, this is not a mathematical formula as such, as in if you put your values in these particular places, you will not get the answer to your balance occlusion or cuspal inclination. It's not a mathematical formula, basically. What he's trying to say is that occlusion plane, cuspal inclination, compensatory curves, all these are directly proportional to your incisal guidance and condylar guidance. And they are inversely proportional to each other, all these three, okay? So what does he mean to say is when your condylar guidance increases, suppose your patient has a very high condylar guidance, okay? You will have to compensate to give balanced occlusion by increasing cuspal inclination or increasing the compensating curves 
or increase in your occlusal plane because these these are directly proportional if you get this whole remainder uh, over here you can maybe uh, imagine that these three are directly proportional to your condylar guidance so if your condylar guidance increases any one of these things will have to be increased to get balanced occlusion in your complete denture same thing with incisal guidance so if you remember this formula any uh, example or any clinical situation they put forward in an mcq question you will be able to solve it okay so they uh, what questions are asked basically if a patient has an increased condylar guidance what will you do will you increase the occlusal plane decrease the occlusal plane increase compensating curve so for that you have to remember this formula which is very important and you will be able to solve all those clinical situations okay so coming to each of those factors now there are five factors which we said influence the balance occlusion so coming to each of them so the first factor the factor number 1 is condylar guidance now it is defined uh, as it is the mandibular guidance generated by the condyles tra traversing the contours of the glenoid fossa okay we will concentrate on this diagram here this is the uh, glenoid fossa okay and this is your articular eminence okay it is the articular eminence this is your glenoid fossa so now the condylar guidance is the mandibular guidance generated by the condyles traversing the contours of this glenoid fossa so imagine a condyle here traversing the contour of your glenoid fossa so that is your condylar guidance basically and how do you get your condylar guidance angle is by drawing a line against the articular eminence and this line against the horizontal plane of your frankfurt's plane gives you your condylar angle that th this is your condylar angle this black color line if you can see this is your angle of condylar guidance okay that's how you calculate it now your condylar part depends on four basic things that is the bone contour of the tmj muscles of mastication ligaments of the tmj and neuromuscular control of the patient these four things dictate your condylar pathway and how your condyle is going to travel according uh, 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 along your glenoid fossa okay now the basic main points to remember in condylar guidance from your mcq or neat point of view is that it is duplicated in the articulator okay it is the only factor that is obtained from the patient and is not under the control of the dentist this is a very important point to be noted it is the only factor that is obtained from the patient so how much ever you want the dentist cannot uh, alter these values whatever you get is from the patient you cannot put whatever you feel like okay it has to be from the patient and cannot be altered by the dentist so it's not under the control of the dentist it is expressed in degrees because it's an angle and the average value is around 25 to 30 degrees okay now as i was telling you they will give you different clinical situations so i have made one clinical situation over here now what if the condylar guidance is shallow meaning it is on the lower side if you have a lower condylar guidance what happens is since there's a lower condylar guidance there is less posterior separation of the teeth therefore it requires teeth with shorter cusps and a gentle occlusal plane and shallow compensating curves as i told you before we we have to apply thielmans formula here now in a shallow condylar guidance if we go to the formula back to the formula if the condylar guidance is shallow or less it is directly proportional to your cuspal inclination occlusal plane and compensating curves directly proportional meaning decrease in condylar guidance you will have to decrease the cusp angle decrease the occlusal plane and give shallow compensating curves which has been written over here now you are understanding i hope you will understand what i'm trying to say so that formula is the basics how you will uh, treat your uh, cases in the future with a shallow condylar guidance a normal condylar guidance or a steep condylar guidance okay so if there was a steep condylar guidance it would be the exact opposite of what has been written here now coming to the second factor that is the incisal guidance it is the influence of the contacting surfaces of the maxillary and mandibular anterior teeth on mandibular movements so if you can see in this diagram here this is the maxillary anterior tooth this is the mandibular anterior tooth so the influence of the contacting surfaces of the mandibular and maxillary anterior teeth on mandibular movements so when the mandible is protruded it's going to glide on this palatal surface of the maxillary teeth 
okay and this guidance is called as your incisal guidance basically the incisal guidance is uh, dependent on your overjet and your overbite okay now what is the incisal guide angle it is the angle formed by the intersection of the plane of occlusion this is the plane of occlusion with the sagittal plane within the sagittal plane determined by the incisal edges of the maxillary and mandibular central incisors when the teeth are in maximum intercuspation so it is the angle formed by the plane of occlusion in the sagittal plane that is this line if you can see and by the incisal edges of the maxillary and mandibular teeth if you draw a line joining the incisal edges of the maxillary and mandibular teeth and extend it anteriorly and posteriorly and this will intersect with your plane of occlusion in the sagittal plane you will get an angle okay this angle is called as the incisal guide angle okay now points to uh, remember uh, sorry points to remember in the incisal guide angle is that it is established during trial it is determined by the dentist and customized for patient during trial it is expressed in degrees and the average value is around 10 to 20 degrees okay now let's see how it uh, it uh, affects our uh, factors now coming to the first diagram okay you can see that the uh, maxillary anterior teeth and the mandibular anterior teeth are coinciding and there's a kind of a deep bite okay the, there is a great vertical overlap okay so greater the vertical overlap steeper the incisal guidance as you can see if you draw a line from the mandibular uh, maxillary incisal edge to the mandibular incisal edge this is the line and we draw a line for the occlusal plane so we get a very steep incisal guidance steep as in higher incisal guide higher the value is higher that is called a steep incisal guidance okay so this angle becomes steep so what happens if there is a steep incisal guidance there is increased posterior separation therefore you will have to give steep cusps steep compensatory curves to create a balanced occlusion in your complete denture if you don't do if you don't do that you are not going to get balanced occlusion but what happens is steep cusps and steep compensatory curves are detrimental to the stability of the denture so greater the vertical over overlap greater will be your cusps greater the compensatory curves and that will be detrimental to the stability of the denture we do not want a very steep incisal guidance basically now in the second picture there is a greater horizontal overlap now if there is a greater horizontal overlap what happens there is a flatter incisal guidance and that is what we want the more flatter the incisal guidance the better is our uh, uh, stability or better are the results in our complete denture basically and the last thing is that for complete denture the incisal guidance should be as flat as possible as flat as possible meaning as flat as the aesthetics and phonetics of the patient permits you cannot make it flat and there will be no aesthetics at all or the phonetics will be affected it should be within the physiological limits of the patient and theoretically it is said that the best stability is when the incisal guide angle is zero degrees that is theoretically it is said when the incisal guidance is zero degrees you will get the best stability okay but we cannot give zero degrees every time for the patient it will be very unesthetic the third point is your occlusal plane it is the average plane established by the incisal and occlusal surfaces of the teeth uh, and is generally not a planar mean of the curvature of these surfaces it is established anteriorly by the height of the lower canine which nearly coincides with the angle of the mouth or the commissure of the mouth and posteriorly by the height of the retromolar path so the height of the occlusal plane anteriorly is determined by the height of the lower canine and posteriorly by the height of the retromolar pad that is two thirds of the retromolar pad it is usually parallel to the allotragus line or the campus line and it should be oriented in the same relation as the previous teeth existed now can we play with the occlusal plane factor yes we can play with it we can change it a little bit 
but tilting of the plane more than 10 degrees is not advisable. So within a range of 10 degrees, you can tilt, can lower or increase uh, your occlusal plane, but not more than 10 degrees, okay? Now, uh, a steep increase in the inclination of the occlusal plane will result in the movement of the upper denture backwards. Now, we are, uh, what we are trying to explain is, if we increase the plane more than 10 degrees, what will happen? Okay, if we increase the plane more than 10 degrees, as you can see over here, the denture will, the upper denture moves backwards and the lower denture moves forwards during function. Therefore, there will be a kind of an in inclined plane act acting over there and it will not uh, be stable. And a decrease in the inclination will result in the opposite. Suppose we decrease the inclination as seen over here. Again, the denture bases will slide on the tissues in an opposite way. So it has to be a balance between this and you should not increase or decrease the plane more than 10 degrees. Now the fourth factor is compensating curves. It is defined as the anterior, posterior and lateral curves in the alignment of the occluding surfaces and incisal edges of the artificial teeth that are used to develop a balanced occlusion. Now uh, these curves are basically why uh, compensating curves are given in our uh, complete dentures is basically to um, pre prevent the Christensen's phenomenon happening. Now what is Christensen's phenomenon is when we protrude our teeth in a natural dentition, when we protrude our teeth in a natural dentition, there is a bit of black space that occurs or there is a gap you could say between your posterior teeth which occurs in a natural dentition okay that is normal in your natural dentition and we do not need to compensate this for any reason because uh, our natural teeth are strong enough to uh, withstand this now what happens in your complete denture if you do the same thing if you protrude your lower mandibular jaw and you have a complete denture in the mouth just imagine you're protruding your jaw with complete dentures in your mouth and your uh, teeth, maxillary and mandibular anterior teeth are edge to edge, and there is that gap that forms between the posterior teeth, the, the denture will not be stable. It will tilt. Basically, the denture will hit in the front and it will tilt. Therefore, we need to give these compensating curves so that, that there is no posterior separation that occurs. So the Christensen phenomenon does not occur. We have to give compensating curves to prevent Christensen's phenomenon from happening in our complete dentures. So the compensating curves are divided into anterior posterior and mediolateral curves. The anterior posterior curve is the curve of SPI. It is the anatomic curvature of the occlusal alignment of the teeth beginning at the tip of the lower canine. It begins at the tip of the lower canine and, the, and following the buccal cusps of the natural premolars and the molars continuing to the anterior border of the ramus okay so it starts at the cuspid that is the lower canine follows all the cusps of the premolars and the molars and it continues to the anterior border of the ramus this is the curve of speed described by graph one speed now the significance is when the patient moves his mandible forward the posterior teeth are set on this curve will continue to remain in contact and thus avoiding disocclusion what i told you the christensen's phenomenon the posterior disclusion which happens okay the posterior disclusion which happens when the protrusion is uh, happening of the mandible is prevented by this curve of speed you can understand it better what i'm trying to say in this diagram just concentrate now just imagine we do not give a curve of speed we do not give any compensating curves okay it's going to be a flat plane like this now when the mandibular teeth move forward and the teeth are edge to edge can you see this posterior disocclusion which is happening now in this kind of case what will happen you think since only the dentures are contacting in the front region won't this denture tilt definitely it will tilt right it will move upwards since it's contacting here and same with the upper so to prevent this posterior disocclusion from happening in our complete denture, what we have to do is give a compensating curve, that is the curve of speed, so that when, you can see in this picture, when we protrude the mandible and it contacts here anteriorly, there is also a simultaneous contact which is happening at the back. So it will not tilt because it is stopped, right? 
So incorporating the curve of spay will provide posterior tooth contact during protrusion and therefore it will prevent the tilting of your denture bases. Okay, I hope this concept is clear. Now that was the anterior posterior curve. Coming to the lateral curves, the first lateral curve is the curve of Wilson. It is a curve of occlusion which is convex upwards. It is convex upwards, okay. It is used to arrange molars. Lower teeth are lingually inclined. As you can see in this picture, it is or the lower teeth are lingually inclined, thus giving a prominent buccal cusp, okay. So this is used to arrange molars where the ling lower teeth are lingually inclined, meaning the lower cusp is lower and the buccal cusp is at a higher uh, region. And therefore, the buccal cusp is given more prominence. So this is called the curve of Wilson. The next curve is the curve of monsoon, the curve of occlusion in which each cusp and the incisal edges touches to a segment of the sphere of 8 inch in the diameter which is the center at the glabella. Okay? It runs across the palatal and the buccal cusp of the maxillary molars. So monsoon gave this curve where he says that each, each cusp and incisal, incisal edge touches a sphere or a segment of the sphere which has a diameter of 8 inches with the center in the region of the glabella. Okay, now the anti monsoon or the reverse curve is opposite of your monsoon curve. Okay, it is usually arranged for your first premolars. Okay, it is usually used to arrange the first premolars. The next medial lateral curve is your pleasure curve, a curve of occlusion which is in transverse cross section to conform to a line which is convex upwards except for the last molar. Now, the pleasure curve is a combination of many curves. It's not a single curve. It's a combination of the monsoons and anti-monsoons curve. So how we use it is that uh, it is used for arranging non-anatomic teeth and balanced occlusion. That is your monoplane teeth. The premolars and first molars are arranged in reverse curve or your anti-monsoons curve. And your second molars are arranged in your monsoons curve. So this is the pleasure curve. It consists of monsoons and anti-monsoon curve in which the premolars and first molars are arranged in your reverse curve fashion and your second molars are arranged in monsoon curve fashion. Now we finished the, uh, the first four um, um, whatever points to uh, uh, lead to balanced occlusion basically. So the fifth and the last point that we have to cover is your cuspal inclination. Now, the angle formed by the inclination of the cusp to your horizontal plane is called the cuspal inclination, okay? Now, the cuspal inclination can be 33 degrees that is seen in anatomic teeth. It can be 20 to 30 degrees that is seen in semi-anatomic teeth and it also can be 90 degrees that is seen in uh, your uh, monoplane teeth. It can be 0 degrees, sorry, not 90 degrees, 0 degrees that is seen in monoplane teeth. That is 0 degrees teeth. Okay, so 33 degrees, I'm repeating, 33 degrees is anatomic, 20 to 30 degrees is semi-anatomic, semi and 0 degrees is non-anatomic or monoplane. Okay. Now, the influence of condylar guidance and incisal guidance on cuspal inclination is as follows. When the teeth are closer to the condylar guidance, Cuspal angulation is influenced by the condylar guidance. Now, what do they mean by teeth are closer to the condylar guidance? Condylar guidance, as you know, is present in your temporomandibular joint. So, which teeth are closer to your temporomandibular joint? Definitely the posterior teeth are more closer to your temporomandibular joint. So, what they mean to say is when the teeth are closer to the condylar guidance, they are influenced by condylar guidance. When the teeth are moved forward and it falls under the influence of the incisal guidance, that is your anterior teeth, it is, uh, it is influenced by incisal guidance, the teeth which are closer to the incisal guidance, that is your anterior teeth. Now we, are, we have finished with um, balanced bilateral balanced occlusion in complete denture. Moving on to monoplane occlusion. It is an occlusal arrangement wherein the posterior teeth have masticatory surfaces that lack any cuspal height meaning it's a flat occlusion, okay? There is no cuspal height, there is zero degrees of cuspal inclination and it is flat. So that is called as monoplane occlusion. Now, when or why do we give monoplane occlusion? 
It is mostly indicated in poor residual ridges in, in patients who are Bruxers or who have Parkinson's disease, basically who have poor neuromuscular control. Any arch discrepancies in your very severe class three malocclusions or severe class two malocclusions where you cannot do anything surgically and you have to give complete dentures in that way. Severely worn out occlusion on previous dentures or very old dentures. If a patient comes to you with very old dentures which have monoplane occlusion and they're used to it, you cannot directly give anatomically. They will be very un uncomfortable with such uh, steep cusps. So if they are used to monoplane occlusion, we have to give monoplane occlusion in the new denture as well, okay? Now, what are the advantages? Basically, advantages of monoplane occlusion is that it's very easy to arrange. It is simple and a non-adjustable articulator is su sufficient. It is easier, it is an easier occlusal scheme to achieve in severe malocclusion situations or in severe residual ridge resorption cases. The disadvantages are that the appearance is poor because there is no aesthetics because there's, everything is flat, so it won't look like teeth, they'll just look like blocks. Uh, it is seen that there is lesser chewing efficiency in these patients and unstable in patients with a steep condylar guidance. If the patient has a steep condylar guidance, it is difficult to give a zero degree cuspal angulation. Why? Because again, coming back to Thielman's formula, if there is increased condylar guidance, you have to give an increased uh, occlusal plane or increased compensating curves and higher cusp angles. Okay, so that's why we cannot give a zero degrees. It will be very difficult. Next, coming to lingualized occlusion. Now, this form of denture occlusion, uh, what happens is the maxillary lingual cusp articulates with the mandibular occlusal surface in centric and non-working mandibular positions. So basically, the lingual cusp of the maxillary teeth occlude in the fossa of the mandibular teeth. So basically, there is buccal disocclusion here. The buccal cusp does not occlude. It's only the lingual cusp of the maxillary posterior teeth which are occluding with the fossae of the mandibular posterior teeth. Now, this was uh, this concept was given by Dr. Alfred Geisy of Switzerland. He introduced lingual occlusion, lingualized occlusion. And uh, in 1941, Payne gave basic concepts of lingualized occlusion. And they, he also gave a modification of the anatomy teeth, what you can use to provide lingualized occlusion to your patients. Now there is a big controversy on actually who bought, put forward lingualized occlusion. And also in various MCQs also, uh, questions have been asked uh, regarding this, okay? So mainly what you have to remember is Dr. Alfred Geisy first put forward lingualized occlusion, but no one understood this concept and no one was using this concept much when he introduced it in 1927, okay? People did not understand the concept. People were not using it widely. So in 1941, Dr. Payne came and gave, put forward very uh, basic concepts. So he put it in a very uh, easy manner into points and how do you achieve lingualized occlusion? And he also gave the method how to modify your anatomic teeth. He also introduced a modified anatomic teeth to give lingualized occlusion. So he put forward the concepts in a more uh, practical manner where people then started understanding lingualized occlusion and then started using lingualized occlusion. So basically, pain gave the basic concepts, but it was first put forward or introduced by Dr. Alfred Geisy. Okay. Now the indication of uh, lingualized occlusion is when there is high aesthetic demand. Suppose a patient with neuromuscular disorders uh, who is indicated you uh, who is indicated for monoplane but wants aesthetic uh, uh, teeth. So what you do is give him a lingualized occlusion, okay? Because here in this uh, occlusion there is best of both worlds, okay? You have a little bit of aesthetics and you have a, a good master masticatory efficiency or a chewing efficiency as well. Okay, now why? Because we are using both anatomic and uh, non-anatomic teeth in this occlusion. So what they do is they use the anatomic teeth for the maxillary arch and they use non-anatomic teeth in your mandibular arch. So your maxillary palatal cusp of a anatomic tooth, it occludes with your mandibular fossa, that is of your non-anatomic tooth. So it 
gives a combination of both the best of both worlds that is the monoplane and your um, uh, anatomic tooth basically in severe mandibular ridge atrophy in displaceable supporting tissues when there is malocclusion or a previous successful denture with lingualized occlusion so the advantages are that there is more natural appearance of the teeth especially the upper premolars where it would be flat otherwise it looks very bad there is better chewing efficiency as compared to monoplane occlusion and disadvantages are that there is more challenging arrangement uh, as compared this is as compared to monoplane okay not your anatomic teeth and it cannot be applied to difficult situations. Uh, this uh, brings us to the end of the discussion of occlusion. Now let's uh, go to the MCQs for today. Let's start with the first MCQ. So uh, the first MCQ is the curve which runs anterior to posterior in the natural dentition is called, we just covered this, the anterior posterior curve. Let's go to the options. Option A, curve of Von Spee. Option B, curve of Wilson. Option C, curve of Monsoon. And the last option is pleasure curve. So the answer to this is anterior posterior curve is curve of Spee. So the answer is A, that is one, that is curve of speed, 1A. The answer for 1 is A. Second question, incisal guidance is A, determined by the dentist and is equivalent of the overjet and overbite. B, determined by the dentist and is not related to the overjet and overbite. C, not determined by the dentist and is equivalent of the overjet and overbite. And D, not determined by the dentist and is not related to the overjet and overbite. So the answer to this is A, that is incisal guidance is determined by the dentist and is equivalent of the overjet. I said that when I was explaining about incisal guidance that it is uh, dependent on your overjet and overbite. That is the vertical and horizontal overlap I'd explained to you. And also it is determined by the dentist. So the answer is A. The answer to question number two is A. Question number three, theoretically for maximum stability of complete denture, the incisal guidance should be zero degrees, 45 degrees, 90 degrees, or none of these. And uh, explain this also. So the answer to question number three is A, zero degrees, theoretically they're asking. So theoretically for maximum stability of the complete denture, incisal guidance should be zero degrees. That is option number A. In the development of balanced occlusion in complete denture, during teeth arrangement, a steep condylar path is associated with a low degree of incisal guidance. This requires that the compensating curve should be. Okay, so this is a very good question for you to understand whether you have understand, understood the concept of the Thielmann's formula, what I was uh, emphasizing before. So putting in play Thielmann's formula in this situation, now steep condylar guidance, low degree of incisal guidance. So what happens in a steep condylar guidance? It is directly proportional to your occlusal plane, compensating curves, and your plane of occlusion. Okay, so all these three have to become prominent or steep to compensate for your steep condylar guidance according to Thielmann's formula. So in that case, the option which you should mark is your prominent. Okay, so the answer is 4C. That is because you have a steep condylar guidance associated with a low degree of incisal guidance. Now you will ask me, even incisal guidance is directly proportional to occlusal plane compensating curves and your uh, uh, cuspal height. Now why not decrease all this to make it directly proportional to uh, the incisal guidance? The answer to this is because we cannot, as I told you, condylar guidance is a thing which cannot be altered by the dentist. Okay, It has to come from the patient so that the steep condylar guidance cannot be made into a lower degree condylar guidance. We cannot change this factor. So we have to go according to this factor. Incisal guidance, we can still change here and there during the trying procedure. And it is controllable by the dentist. So we can still change this. But steep condylar guidance cannot be changed because we know it is only in the control of the patient. So we have to use the formula according to the condylar guidance, okay? So the answer to this question number four is C. So you will give prominent compensating curves to compensate for your steep condylar guidance. 
Question number five, theory of equilateral triangle is the same as, the answer to this is C, that is Bonneville's theory. Question number five, the answer is C, Bonneville's theory, okay? Occlusal gate refers to A, the type of occlusion in centric relation, B, the type of occlusion in centric occlusion, a pattern of cyclic movements of the jaw or balanced occlusion. The answer to question number six is C, a pattern of cyclic movements of the jaw. Occlusal gate refers to a pattern of cyclic movements of the jaw. Question number six, C. The concept of lingualized occlusion was put forward by Okay, so we have to know in this question, they're asking the concept of lingual occlusion was put forward by. Now, see, they have put both the options, that is Gaisi and Payne. It's a very co confusing question, I understand, because you would get confused between these two. So since they said concept of lingualized occlusion was put forward, so we mark Payne, because Gaisi did not give any concepts, he just put forward the idea of lingualized occlusion, but the concepts were put forward by Payne, so the answer to this would be D, that is pain. So seven, the answer is D, pain. Question number eight, curve of monsoon is an anterior posterior curve? No, anterior posterior curve is our curve of speed, okay? Is a lateral mover, molar curve with convexity facing downwards, okay? Is a lateral premolar curve? No, it's not a premolar curve. And a reverse curve, no. So the answer to this is B, eight B. It's a lateral molar curve with convexity facing downwards, okay? Question number nine, protrusive records during jaw relations made for recording are made for recording. A, condyla inclination of both sides, B, centric relation, C, record retruded contact position or terminal hinge axis opening. The answer to question nine is protrusive records are used to get our condyla inclination of both sides. So the question number nine answer is A. Henaus Quinn is related to centric occlusion, centric relation, balanced occlusion or compensating curves. The answer to this is C. We've all discussing about balanced occlusion in this, uh, in this uh, lecture today. So this is a very easy question. Henaus Quinn is related to balanced occlusion. Question number 11, according to Thielman's principle of balanced occlusion, when curve of speed increases, when curve of speed increases, what should be done for this? Okay. So now applying the formula, you will know if curve of speed increases, we cannot reduce incisal guidance because it's directly proportional. So it's not this. Okay. Increase in cuspal height. No, because curve of spi is a compensating curve. Compensating curves is inversely proportional to your cusp height. So if you increase curve of spi, you're supposed to decrease cuspal height. So this is again wrong. I'm going according to the Thielman's formula. You'll have to remember the formula and accordingly apply it to this question. Okay. Increase condyla guidance. We can never increase or decrease condyla guidance. So you're not even looking at this option because it's not in control of the dentist. So this is also not there. So the answer to this is actually D, that is none of the above. 11, the answer is D, none of the above, okay? Question number 12, the concept of balanced occlusion is applied primarily to natural dentition, RPD, FPD, or none of the above. Now the concept of balanced occlusion, I've mentioned in my first or second slide in this uh, lecture today, that balanced bilateral balanced occlusion is only precisely only for your complete denture, not for any other situation, not natural dentition, not RPD, not FPD. So bilateral balanced occlusion is only for complete denture, which is not in these options. So the option which we have to mark is option D, 12D, none of the above. Which of the following is not included in Hanau squint? Which of the following is not included in Hanau squint? Prominence of compensating curves, inclination of condyla guidance, height of cusps, all these three are included. Which is not included is, the answer to this is none of the above again. 13D, none of the above. Because all these three options are included in Hanau squint, okay? That is compensating curves, condyla guidance, height of cusps. The other two factors are your incisal guidance and plane of occlusion, okay? So those are the five factors, just to brush up. Question number 14, which of the following factors cannot be changed in complete denture pro prosthodontics? Incisal guidance, compensating curves, height of cusp or condyla guidance? Answer to this is D, 14D. 
the lateral condylar guidance setting is calculated by now this is a question which the answer was there in last week's lecture actually but i still put it up in this way this week's uh, mcqs let's see if you all remember the lateral condylar guide this is the hanau formula basically so the answer to this is a 15 a the answer is l is equal to h by 8 plus 12 this is your hanau's formula for a balanced occlusion when condylar inclination is increased the compensating curve should be the again this the thielmans formula applies now i'm going to be repeating it again so the answer is c 16 c increased and prominent okay a balanced occlusion in maxillary and mandibular complete denture exist when the answer to question number 17 is b this is the base this is the definition basically of balanced occlusion which you have to remember with opposing teeth contact and centric occlusion working balancing and protrusive position okay 17 the answer is b question number 18 the inclination the incline or angulation of the condylar element of the articulator is anatomically related to the the incline or angulation of the condylar element of the articulator is anatomically related to the depth of the glenoid fossa cusp inclines the curvature of the mandible occlusal plane or slope of the articular eminence the answer is slope of the articular eminence that is 18d 18 the answer is the slope of the condylar articular eminence okay the function of the compensating curve is to help provide balanced occlusion to help establish incisal guide plane same as the function of curve of spear or none of the above the answer to this is a 19a question number 20 occlusal plane of denture should be parallel to crest of the alveolar ridge and premolar region yes it should be parallel to this it should be parallel to the alveolar tragus line also it should be parallel to the interpupillary line also so the answer to this is d 20d all of the above okay question number 21 a steep incisal guidance in complete denture steep incisal guidance again lot of questions on this thielmans formula okay so you need to know it very well by heart you cannot forget it ever so you can solve anything with that formula so a steep incisal guidance in complete denture will require steep cusps a shallow compensatory curve is good for occlusal balance or maybe compensated by increasing the over bite the answer to this is a we will require steep cusps for the posterior teeth so if there is a steep incisal guidance steep cusp for posterior teeth because it is directly proportional advantages of balanced occlusion in complete denture are all of the following except the answer to this question is c it helps in all except this definitely it, it helps to improve stability it preserves ridges less interference but it does not increase vertical dimension in any way so the thing is what all of the following except so the answer is c that is increases vertical dimension that is 22c question number 23 the influence of the contacting surfaces of the mandible and maxillary anterior teeth on mandibular movement is called as the incisal guidance Okay, 23C. The phenomenon of posterior separation when incisors are bored edge to edge is called as. The answer to this is also B, 24B. That is Christensen's phenomenon. As I said, the posterior separation or posterior disocclusion which happens is called as the Christensen's phenomenon, which we compensate for in our complete dentures by by giving compensatory curves. Okay. Question number twenty-five: The curve that is convex upwards and is usually arranged, used to arrange first premolar, is called as first premolars is your anti-monsoon curve. Okay, first premolar. If it was molar, then it would be your Wilson's. A reverse curve is convex upwards. It's called as anti-monsoon curve. Used to arrange first premolars, all of the above. The answer to this is all of the above. factors influencing balanced occlusion in complete denture are plane of occlusion cuspal height it is both of the above that is question number 27 the answer is c the answer to question number 27 is c okay which of the following occlusional schemes would be preferred for a patient with neuromuscular disorder 
neuromuscular disorder i said the indications for monoplane occlusion is okay neuromuscular disorder so the answer to this is b 28 b monoplane occlusion question number 29 lingualized occlusion uses that type of artificial teeth anatomic semi anatomic non anatomic and semi anatomic or anatomic and non anatomic so the answer to this is 29 d anatomic and non anatomic they use anatomic teeth in your maxillary arch to give a prominent palatal cusp which occludes which are non anatomic mandibular teeth in the fossa okay i'd explain to the uh, explain to you all about lingualized occlusion before also so the answer to this is d 29 d question number 30 occlusion is a static relationship dynamic relationship both of the above none of the above it is a static relationship so 30 the answer is a now we completed our mcqs for today regarding the chapter for occlusion let's tackle some revision mcqs now these mcqs are of all the topics we have covered till date just to, just to briefly revise what we have studied and to see that we're not forgetting our concepts what we have studied till now okay so the main purpose of covering the retromolar pad area is a stability b retention support and contraction the answer is b retention i hope you all know the answers to all these questions because uh, these are the chapters which we have already covered definitely mcqs are new they are not repetitions but still we should not forget our concepts question number 32 emergency retentive force is atmospheric pressure surface tension cohesion or adhesion it is option number a atmospheric pressure an important factor that aids in stability of complete denture is harmonious occlusion proper extension polishing of the denture base or none of the above the answer to this is harmonious occlusion okay to make an impression of hypoplastic tissue one should use wax use elastomeric impression ensure intimate contact of impression material to the tissue or a uh, user especially fitted tray the answer to question number 34 is c ensure intimate contact of impression material to the tissue question number 34 c okay question number 35 muscles which have uh, has influence in the formation of the buccal frenum of the maxilla we had studied different muscle attachments okay the answer to this is a 35 the answer is a levator angular oris the time intervals for legular follow ups for examination of complete denture where a patient is 3 to 6 months 4 to 8 months 8 to 12 months 12 to 15 months the answer to question number 36 is a 3 to 6 months 3 to 6 months fovea palatini are uh, situated in the soft palate we know this very easy 37 the answer is b soft palate okay The answer to thirty-seven is B, soft palate. Posterior palatal seal is recorded when the head is bent at thirty degrees, one fifty degrees, sixty degrees, or forty-five degrees. The answer to this is A, thirty degrees. Question number thirty-nine: Mandible is capable of maintaining a non-translating rotation. Non-translating. So the the question is for rotation over an arc. Mandible is capable of maintaining on a non-translation motor rotation over an arc. How much? Basically, they are trying to ask you how much of mm of opening will you expect when your mandible or your condyle is only rotating in the fossa. The answer to this is B, twenty to twenty-five. When it is only rotating, it is around twenty to twenty-five. Okay, if it's more than twenty-five, that means it is translating. Okay. Papillary hyperplasia is mostly most commonly seen in palatal tissue beneath partial denture, palatal tissue beneath complete denture, lingual mucosa, or none of the above. Answer to this is B. Palatal tissue beneath complete denture. Mechanism of action of tissue conditioner is distribution of forces evenly. Yes. Obtaining more intimate soft tissue contact. Yes. physical act of massaging the tissue yes so the answer to question number 41 is d all of the above to be effective in treating abused oral tissue the conditioner must be changed every every how many days okay question number 42 the answer is b every 4 to 6 days has to be changed every 
four to six days. Okay. Which of the following is or are a non a non adjustable articulator? True hinge articulator, hinge articulator, both are non adjustable. And now this is also non adjustable. So the answer is D forty three D. All of the above. Phase four is used to transfer the. The answer to question number forty four is A axis orbital plane. Phase four is used to transfer the axis orbital plane. Question number forty five. Only pure hinge movements in the mandible occur at Centric occlusion, centric relation, lateral excursion, or in the terminal hinge position. The answer to question number forty-five is D. In terminal hinge position, question number forty-five D. The correctly placed PPS creates vacuum in posterior part of palate. Vacuum beneath the maxillary denture, partial vacuum beneath the maxillary denture, or a close adaptation of maxillary denture at the tuberosity. The answer to this is partial vacuum. That is question number forty-six. Answer is C. Question number forty-seven. Bilateral balanced occlusion is based on the concept given by A. Von Spee and Monsoon. G. V. Black. Not G. V. Black. Not Sturdivant. Not Devan. So the answer is A. Forty-seven. The answer is A. Question number forty-eight. The greatest potential wear exists between tooth and gold, tooth and tooth. Porcelain and tooth and porcelain with porcelain. So the answer to question number forty-eight is C. Definitely, porcelain with tooth has maximum wear. <clears throat> maximum bite force in complete denture is dash times the natural teeth. Okay. Question number forty-nine. The answer is C. Five to six times more than natural teeth. And the last question for today. The teeth are. In occlusal contact for the following percent percent of times in a day, ninety four percent. Not I don't think it is ninety four percent. Definitely not ten to fifteen. No, six to eight or two to six. I would be confused between these two. But the answer is D, two to six percent. The answer is two to six percent. Question number fifty. The answer is two to six percent. Okay. Coming to the end of today, okay. So that's it for today. Uh, we finished with occlusion and few revision MCQs also. In my next lecture, I'll be dealing with selection of artificial teeth and teeth arrangement and trying. Uh, please read up and come about this so we can uh, answer the MCQs quickly and finish them. This will be my uh, uh, sixth lecture on complete denture in the next. in the next uh, lecture it will be the sixth lecture okay so study well till then i'll see you all next time thank you